Welcome to Christ Center Community on Upper Caswell Lake. May our time together, learning about God and His expectations of us, be a mighty blessing to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son into the world that we might be in a relationship with you, that we might get to know you, and that we might bring you glory. May we each be receptive vessels to that which you want to bless us with this day from your written word. May the Holy Spirit use this message to help us recognize when our perspective and our presuppositions are standing as a roadblock to understanding your written word and to us playing the part you've assigned us to play in your plan to redeem the world you love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you like guarantees? A few years ago, I purchased several nice strands of GE LED outdoor Christmas lights. The light strands could be connected together and could display clear or blue lights, which enabled me to turn on the blue lights during the Christmas season and the clear lights after Christmas through the end of February to help offset the long dark of the winter months here in South Central Alaska. The second year I got them out to use them. Three of the strands would not light up. Thankfully, the warranty period was still in effect. So I followed the warranty instructions and mailed them to the stipulated address. Within three weeks, I received new replacement strands in the mail. In other words, they stood behind their claims. It is reasonable to assume we all hope and expect that which we buy will live up to its claims, and if not, that the warranty will make things right. That is also true of people. We hope and expect that they will live up to their claims as well. As we continue on in our walk through the gospel according to John's sermon series today, such is the case at hand. Jesus having driven from the temple, outer court, or the court of the Gentiles, those selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and the money changers, and having declared, take these things away, stop making my father's house a place of business, is being confronted by the Jews. For by his actions and his words, Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah, the Son of God. With that in mind, let us consider our text for today. John 2, verses 18 through 22. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Our text for today contains a question, a response, and an erroneous assumption. We'll begin with the question. In verse 18, it is apparent Jesus' actions boiled down to a matter of authority in the mind of the Jews. For the Jews said to Jesus, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Taking into consideration the context, it is reasonable to assume the Jews were not happy with Jesus' actions or words. After all, he had just disrupted their business practices and their process for worshipers to acquire acceptable sacrificial animals and to exchange money. He had just created chaos. He had just exhibited authority over the temple court of the Gentiles, yet he was not a Levite who served as the priest for Israel and as managers of the temple. His actions most certainly disrupted their business as usual day, with animals fleeing, tables turned over, and coins scattered on the ground. 
They might have even felt rather embarrassed by Jesus' righteousness as compared to their unrighteousness with respect to the temple. In any case, they resorted to the tried and the true. That is, they asked him for a sign to prove his authority and his claim with respect to the temple, being his father's house, which implied he was the Son of God. The sign they expected was a miraculous sign. For historically, God had used signs as a means to convince them and others of his presence and will, at least as far back as Exodus 4. For when Moses feared Israel would not believe God had spoken to him, God gave him a sign to use to convince them. That sign being turning Moses' staff into a serpent. And then, when Moses grabbed it by the tail, God turned it back into a staff once again. So for the Jews, asking for a sign was their means of discerning the truth. But just because they asked for a sign does not mean Jesus was going to give them a sign. For often during Jesus' public ministry, the Jewish leaders asked Jesus to give them a sign. But he refused to do so, except for the sign of Jonah, which depicts death, burial, and resurrection, as in Matthew 12, verses 38 to 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Which brings us to the response. In verse 19, Jesus answers them by speaking of a forthcoming sign that would surpass their greatest expectations. However, his answer was mysterious and impossible for them to understand. For he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. It was a statement they misunderstood, but they would never forget. For three years later, they quoted it at Jesus' trial and even used it to mock him while he was on the cross. As stated, it appears that Jesus did not want them to understand what he was saying at that time. For even his own disciples didn't understand the meaning of his statement until after his death and resurrection. Thus, it is apparent that stating his response clearly in a manner they could understand would not have been in line with his father's will or timing. However, his response clearly reveals to us that from the beginning of his ministry, Jesus had the end of his ministry in view. One can hardly escape the conviction that the fourth gospel depicts the career of Jesus as a voluntary progress towards a predetermined goal in God's perfect timing. The allusions to the destruction of the temple of his body, as in our text for today, to the elevation on a cross, as in John 3, verse 14, and John 12, verses 32 to 33, to the giving of his flesh for the life of the world, as in John 6, verse 51, to his burial, as in John 12, verse 7, and the announcement of his betrayal and death to his disciples, as in John 13, verses 19 and 21, attest to his consciousness of the fate that awaited him in Jerusalem. Though the disciples did not comprehend the situation that day or during Jesus' career, the resurrection place the memory of his sayings in a new perspective. A perspective shared by a little boy who once taught his Sunday school class a lesson about the resurrection of Christ that they understood immediately and would never forget. Little Philip, born with Down syndrome, 
attended a third grade Sunday school class with several other eight-year-old boys and girls. Typical of that age, the children did not readily accept Phyllis, Philip with his differences, according to an article in Leadership Magazine. But because of a creative teacher, they began to care about Philip and accept him as part of the group, though not fully. The Sunday after Easter, the teacher brought legs pantyhose containers, the kind that looked like large eggs. Each receiving one, the children were told to go outside on that lovely spring day, find some symbol for new life, and put it in the egg-like container. Back in the classroom, they would share their new life symbols, opening the containers one by one in surprise fashion. After running through the church property in wild confusion, the students returned to the classroom and placed the containers on the table. Surrounded by the children, the teacher began to open them one by one. After each one, whether a flower, butterfly, or leaf, the class would ooh and ah. Then one was opened, revealing nothing inside. The children exclaimed, that's stupid, that's not fair, somebody didn't do their assignment. Philip spoke up, that's mine. Philip, you don't ever do things right, the students retorted. There's nothing there. I did so do it, Philip insisted. I did do it. It's empty. The tomb is empty. Silence followed. From then on, Philip became a full member of the class. He died not long afterward from an infection most normal children would have shrugged off. At the funeral, this class of eight-year-olds marched up to the altar, not with flowers, but with their Sunday school teacher, each to lay on his casket an empty pantyhose egg, for Philip understood the resurrection symbolized by the empty tomb. Which brings us to the erroneous assumption. In verse 20, the Jews responded, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? Judging from this response to Jesus' answer, the Jewish leaders must have thought that Jesus was a lunatic, for they assumed he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem that had already taken 46 years to rebuild and apparently wasn't finished yet. For Josephus, the Roman historian, said that about 18,000 workmen were employed in the task of rebuilding the temple and that the temple wasn't finished until 64 A.D. The Jews must have surmised that Jesus had to be crazy thinking he could rebuild that massive, ornate, structure in just three days. They were blinded by their limited perspective of what man can do versus what God can do. Little did they realize that Jesus was going to do something that was beyond their wildest expectation. For in his response to their question, he was referring to the day that he would bring his own dead body back to life after having been tried, crucified, dying, and lying three days in a tomb. For from the beginning of his ministry, Jesus had the end of his ministry in view. He was referring to fulfilling his claim of being the Son of God and having been given the authority to lay down his life and the authority to take it up again. The originator of a new religion came to the great French diplomat, Talleyrand, and complained that he could not make any converts. What would you suggest I do, he asked. I should recommend that you get yourself crucified and then die, but be sure to rise again on the third day. For it is the resurrected living Christ that holds Christianity together and draws people to it. Jesus' description of himself as a temple brings to mind several images from the Old Testament 
The tabernacle in the wilderness was just a tent until it was consecrated and the Spirit of God came and filled it. Then it became the tabernacle of the Lord and the Shekinah glory shone out from it. The people saw it and worshiped God who now dwelt there. The temple of Solomon was just a beautiful building until it was consecrated and the Spirit of God filled it. Then it became a temple where people were drawn together to worship the Lord. Such was the case with Jesus. Just as Jesus described his body as a temple, our bodies are temples also. For once we confess and repent of our sins and ask Jesus to be our Savior, he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. Thus, it's not enough to believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. It is not enough to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God incarnate who walked among us. For those things are just the first step on the staircase to holiness. There is also the need for consecration and growing in the likeness of Christ by way of the transforming power of the Holy Spirit and devoting one's life to Jesus. For he died for us. Should we not live for him? Is your body that is your life, an outward testimony of forgiveness and joy because of the death of Christ for you? Does your body, that is your life, reveal that Christ reigns in you and that the Holy Spirit fills and controls you? Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Becoming a Christian is not a limited term rental agreement or a lease. It is a permanent transfer of ownership of our lives to God, our Creator. So like Jesus, who from the beginning of his ministry had the end of his ministry in view, let us keep the end in view as well by cooperating with the Holy Spirit. For as Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That end being, spending eternity in heaven, where we can bask in the glory of our Heavenly Father and can see Jesus face to face. For unlike the Jews whose perspective was limited when they questioned Jesus at the temple that day, our perspective is 2020. We are without excuse. Unlike them, we know the rest of the story. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, unlike the Jews who questioned your son that day, whose perspective was very limited, our perspective should be 2020, for we know the rest of the story. We know your son died for our sins. We know he was crucified and rose from the dead on the third day. We know we are without an excuse. May Jesus reign in our minds, hearts, and lives that we might play the role you've assigned us to play in your plan to redeem the world you love and that we might bring you glory. In all that we say or do, may others see Christ in us. And may the Holy Spirit convict us whenever we are not cooperating with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully you can join us again next week for our Easter Sunday sermon. When God calls you home, may Jesus greet you with, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you.